And so a lot of your brain is focusing on that tiny little pinpoint that you use that's foveal vision. And it seems to be about big enough so that you can, you can bring a face into high resolution in the center and you can track the movements of the various elements of the faces. If you, if you look at someone and you look about 18 inches to their left or to the right, you'll see that you can't see their nose anymore. You see a kind of a vague outline of their face, you can still see the color. You can detect their eyebrows and you can detect their mouth, especially if their mouth moves or their eyes move. You just zero in on that right away. And again, so what's happening is that way out here, your vision is incredibly low resolution, and then the resolution increases to the center where it's very, very high. And you, and, but, and then there's some tweaks like, okay, you can't really see out here, but you can see motion. And that's good enough because as soon as something moves, you can turn your head because you can turn your head and your eyes, and then you can focus that little pinpoint on it and dance around because that's what you do with the pinpoint. It moves around very rapidly. And then you can scan that central area with, with high resolution. And so it's an efficient use of limited resources. So, so partly the way that you manage in the world, which is very, very complicated, is that even your senses simplify it for you. You know, there's only... You can't see the entire spectrum of electromagnetic radiation. You can only see the visual light spectrum. It's very narrow. There's a whole range of sounds you can't hear. There's things you can't smell. So, you know, you're in a box and some things get through, but not everything. So that simplifies things for you right off the bat. And, you know, hypothetically, those things you do detect were those things that it was necessary for you to detect for you to be here over this vast span of time. And no doubt there were variants all the way through that tried to parse it up differently, slightly differently, and that didn't work out as well. So they aren't around. So you're around because of this, of death and replication. So that, you know, it's an interesting take on death, eh? Because you're the product of an unbelievable number of deaths. Right? Because... All of those experiments had to take place in some sense for there to be you to, for you to be here at all. So, anyways, okay. Then, so you can see with your central vision that you focus in on one point and then you reduce the others to to low resolution representations, maybe even cartoons. And then I also think, although I don't know this for sure, and someone has undoubtedly done the work, my suspicions are is that in the periphery, you don't update. You know how your screen updates? It's 60 cycles a second, something like that. You update your vision at about 60 cycles per second. And we know that because if the screen resolution, or if the screen update decreases below 60 cycles a second, people can start to see it flicker. So we have a refresh rate. It's around 60 hertz. And some people can see flicker at higher, at higher hertz than that, but, but most people can't. 60 is about right. So that's another way that you deal with the fact that there's way too much for you to deal with. Your, your temporal resolution isn't very high. You know, so the, the smallest meaningful event for you is about a tenth of a second long. Now, if, if you're in a car accident or you're in some situation where it's an emergency and you get a massive burst of dopamine, you might be able to speed that processing up by a hundredfold. Who knows? But you're going to be absolutely exhausted instantly when you do that. I don't know if you've ever experienced that in a car accident or something like that, but people often report that time slows down dramatically, and but then afterwards they're just, they're, they're done. So the reason you don't see a thousand times as fast as you do is because you'd have to be eating like a hummingbird, right? You need a big vat of nectar attached to you, and it, you'd be just sipping on it or gulping it down nonstop. So you're also kind of restricted in terms of your temporal resolution. Okay. Well, then what else do you do to simplify the world? Well... This is where the tool concept of concept, the tool concept of concept starts to become useful because you're actually aiming at things all the time. And I really like the aim metaphor because if you understand the metaphor well, it really sheds some light on what human beings are like. Chimps are hunters, but they're not hunters like human beings are hunters. We're really, really good hunters. Chimps, they have to kind of mob an animal and then they'll tear it apart. And they like, they like meat, so they'll definitely do it. But human beings have been hunting in an unbelievably sophisticated way for a tremendous amount of time. And there's a bunch of things about us that aren't like chimps. So one is we can throw. And our bodies are built for throwing. Now you might think, well, that's not that relevant. But if something is chasing you through the bush and you can throw a rock at it, it becomes relevant very quickly. And so we're really good at taking projectiles 
specifying targets and hurling the projectiles at targets. And we can do that with rocks, and we can do it with bows, and we can do it with rifles, and we can do it with nuclear weapons. And so there's something about us that's obsessed with hitting the middle of the target. Now, there's an interesting side note for that, which is that the word sin is derived from the Greek word hamartia. And hamartia is an archery term that means to miss the center of the target. So now that's something very much worth thinking about. It's a very lovely concordance. And so we're built on this hunting platform. We can track moving things extraordinarily well. We have amazing eyesight. Our eyesight's better than any primate by a huge amount and better than any other creature except for like hawks and other birds of prey. So, and we also, you, so we have this intent, amazing capacity to zero in. And here's some cool things about your eyes. So if you look at a gorilla, you'll see that a gorilla doesn't really have whites in their eyes. And you might think, well, that's kind of weird because we do. And so what's the hypothesis? Well, if I'm looking at somebody at the back of the room, I can tell if they're looking at my eyes. If they're looking at my nose, it's, it's almost as if their face just gets a little bit vaguer, like we're not communicating. It's eye-to-eye -eye contact. And so our ability to specify the direction in which another person's eyes are pointing is phenomenal. And you might say, well, why? Well, first of all, there's a lot of expression around the eyes, right? So you can imagine a coevolution. The coevolution is sharper and sharper vision, vision associated with detecting eyes, and then also more and more evolution for, for emotional expression around the eyes. So there's that. But then the other thing that I wanted, the reason that I would be interested in that is because I want to know what the hell you're up to. Because maybe you're a friend and maybe you're a foe, or maybe you're interested in something that I should be interested in. And so we know what people are like in that regard. So you go stand out in the corner and you look up. And soon there are 10 people gathered around you looking up. And why is that? It's because when they see where your eyes are pointed and embody you, they think, well, that person, they don't think this. It's the equivalent of thinking. They think, well, that person must be looking at something interesting because that's what people look at. And if it's interesting to them, then it's probably going to be interesting to me, especially if it's in the sky. It's like, what the hell? That's not supposed to be happening. So you're looking at people's eyes because you want to know what they're up to in their facial display, which is your face is unbelievably innervated and controllable, both by conscious and unconscious means. That tells you what they're up to, which is why you want to see someone's face. You don't talk to the back of their head. You want to talk to their face. And you don't like it when they're looking like this or looking like that or failing to make eye contact. Although too much eye contact is a predatory stare. So, you know, you go, well, you've got you to get the balance right. So, now, what about the whites of the eyes? Well, the theory is, is that the reason we developed whites is because it was easier to see where someone's eyes were pointed if there was a dark circle in a white space. And what that basically meant was that all your ancestors who were a little less fortunate on the eye white side either didn't mate or got killed probably in misunderstandings. So, so our, eyes, our eyes stand out against this bright white background because that helps, us, that helps other people detect what we're up to and that means we can trust each other more easily. And we can Even something as simple as like eye contact in a situation where there's a possibility of finding a sexual partner is a very important component of that because eye contact indicates interest and it also indicates, at least in principle, the possibility of approach. And so approach is, a, is dopaminergically mediated, and it's a positive emotional state. And that's also why, interestingly enough, if you go into a, gross, into a uh, pharmacy and there's a rack of magazines, and there are, what's on the cover? Always, almost always. Beautiful woman. Like on 50% of the men's magazines, there's a beautiful woman, and on like 100% of the women's <laughs> magazines, which is really interesting, you know, because you might think, well, why is that? Well, and the woman's eyes are always looking out in a way that they're looking at you. So, there was some interest. So, it's an invocation of interest. And so, you know, magazines evolve. All the ones that don't get bought fail. And so what's happened is they all converge to the same point. And the same point is the thing that's maximally interesting to a magazine purchaser is a, fem is a beautiful female face, whether it's male or female. Now, on the male side, there's also gadgets of all sorts. So, and that may be because men are more gadget-oriented than women. So, anyways. And we also know that, for example, with men, if you show them, this is a funny little study. So you show them a be the, the face of a beautiful woman, and her eyes are looking that way, or this way, or they're looking right at him. 
you can check the activity in the dopaminergic center in a place called the nucleus accumbens, which is the same place that cocaine hits. Face on eye contact, that thing lights up. It lights up even more if she's wearing a red dress. <laughs> right, and you can get the same kind of lighting up with a red curvy sports car. <laughs> yeah. So it's, uh, you know, my, my, my thought when I, when, I, when I read that was the perfect situation is like a beautiful girl dressed in red, perched on a sports car with some cocaine. <laughs> why, why red? Why red? Why red? Yes. That's a, good, that's a good question. I'm not exactly sure why. Oh, that's wrong. I do know why red. <laughs> ripe fruit. <laughs> Women have co-evolved with ripe fruit. <laughs> it's very sneaky of you, by the way. So that's why you know that, too. You just have to leaf through a women's magazine. And the lipstick is always associated with, like, apples that are glistening in some way, or a peach or something like that. And we're, we were primarily fruit eaters. And the reason we have color vision is to detect... Fruit, ripe fruit. And so part of the reason that, also part of the reason that fruit turns red or colored when it ripens is because the fruit that was successfully eaten by creatures that distributed the six seeds was the fruit that was ripe when it was eaten. And so as the color vision evolved, maybe there was a red tint for God only knows what reason, then a positive feedback loop developed and fruit got redder and redder. And at the same time, women capitalized on that. So... That's partly, I think, what explains the association between Eve and the apple in, in, the, in Genesis. Because Genesis is always, also a story about gaining sight. So, yeah, so that's why I read. So that's pretty funny. I really think that's pretty funny. So, you know, evolved, mod, evolved sensory significance is absolutely everywhere, you know. And it, it's so deep inside of us. Yeah. I'd have to wonder about blood, too. It seems like it also oh, yeah, water. yeah, yeah. Red's a significant color. But I think, I mean, and it's funny too because say, say there's a flushed face. Well, that means it's infused with blood. It's also a sign of health. It's also a sign of sexual arousal. But it is a sign of health. And so you see in, in old coke ads from the 1930s, the girl's cheeks are so red that, you know, it looks like she has a fever. So it's, it's often, it's a, it's a form of sexual signaling that indicates uh, health. So that's another part. I mean, these are multiply determined, right? It is anything as complex as vision. Yeah, and blood means, hey, maybe don't go there. Or maybe it means there's something to eat. Right, right.